depict the last life of the Buddha. Indeed, stone carvings in India provide an important source for identifying which events in the lives of the Buddha were considered most important by the community. The Jataka stories are also well known beyond India. In Southeast Asia, the story of Prince Vesantara, the Buddha's penultimate reincarnation, who demonstrates his dedication to the virtue of charity by giving away his sacred elephant, his children, and finally his wife, is as well known as that of his last lifetime. Lives of the Buddha that trace events from his birth to his death appeared in the 2nd century CE. One of the most famous is the Sanskrit poem Buddha Charita, Acts of the Buddha, by Ashvagosa. Texts such as the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya, probably dating from the 4th or 5th century CE, attempt to gather the many stories of the Buddha into a single chronological account. The purpose of these biographies in many cases is less to detail the unique deeds of Shakyamuni's life than to demonstrate the ways in which the events of his life conform to a pattern that all Buddhas of the past have followed. According to some, all past Buddhas had left the life of the householder after observing the four sites. All had practiced austerities, all had achieved enlightenment at Bodh Gaya, all had preached in the Deer Park at Sarnath, and so on. The life of the Buddha was written and rewritten in India and across the Buddhist world, elements added and subtracted as necessary. Sites that became important pilgrimage places, but that had not been mentioned in previous accounts, would be retrospectively sanctified by the addition of a story about the Buddha's presence there. Regions that Buddhism entered long after his death, such as Sri Lanka, Kashmir, and Burma, now Myanmar, added narratives of his magical visitations to accounts of his life. No single version of the life of the Buddha would be accepted by all Buddhist traditions. For more than a century, scholars have focused on the life of the Buddha, with the earliest investigations attempting to isolate and identify historical elements amid the many legends. Because of the centuries that had passed between the actual life and the composition of what might be termed a full biography, most scholars abandoned this line of inquiry as unfruitful. Instead, they began to study the processes, social, political, institutional, and doctrinal, responsible for the regional differences among the narratives of the Buddha. The various uses made of the life of the Buddha are another topic of interest. In short, the efforts of scholars have shifted from an attempt to derive authentic information about the life of the Buddha to an effort to trace stages in and the motivations for the development of his biography. It is important to reiterate that the motivation to create a single life of the Buddha, beginning with his previous births and ending with his passage into Nirvana, occurred rather late in the history of Buddhism. Instead, the biographical tradition of the Buddha developed through the synthesis of a number of earlier and independent fragments. And biographies of the Buddha have continued to be composed over the centuries and around the world. During the modern period, for example, biographies have been written that seek to demythologize the Buddha and to emphasize his role in presaging modern ethical systems, social movements, or scientific discoveries. What follows is an account of the life of the Buddha that is well known, yet synthetic, bringing together some of the more famous events from various accounts of his life, which often describe and interpret these events differently. Previous Lives of Buddha Many biographies of the Buddha begin not with his birth in his last lifetime, but in a lifetime millions of years before, when he first made the vow to become a Buddha. According to a well-known version, many eons ago there lived a Brahmin named, in some accounts, Sumedha, who realized that life is characterized by suffering and then set out to find a state beyond death. He retired to the mountains, where he became a hermit, practiced meditation, and gained yogic powers. While flying through the air one day, he noticed a great crowd around a teacher, whom Sumedha learned was the Buddha Dipankara. When he heard the word Buddha, he was overcome with joy. Upon Dipampara's approach, Sumedha loosened his yogin's matted locks and laid himself down to make a passage across the mud for the Buddha. Sumedha reflected that were he to practice the teachings of Dipampara, he could free himself from future rebirth in that very lifetime.
but he concluded that it would be better to delay his liberation in order to traverse the longer path to Buddhahood. As a Buddha, he could lead others across the ocean of suffering to the farther shore. Dipankara paused before Sumedha and predicted that many eons, hence the Shogun with matted locks, would become a Buddha. He also prophesied Sumedha's name in his last lifetime, Gautama, and the names of his parents and chief disciples and described the tree under which the future Buddha would sit on the night of his enlightenment. Over the subsequent eons, the Bodhisattva would renew his vow in the presence of each of the Buddhas who came after Dipankara, before becoming the Buddha Shakyamuni himself. Over the course of his lifetimes as a bodhisattva, he accumulated merit punya, through the practice of six, or ten, virtues. After his death as Prince Vesantara, he was born in the Tusita heaven, whence he surveyed the world to locate the proper site of his final birth. Birth and Early Life He determined that he should be born the son of the King Shudhodana of the Sakya clan, whose capital was Kapilavastu. Shortly thereafter, his mother, the Queen Mahamaya, dreamed that a white elephant had entered her womb. Ten lunar months later, as she strolled in the garden of Lumbini, the child emerged from under her right arm. He was able to walk and talk immediately. A lotus flower blossomed under his foot at each step, and he announced that this would be his last lifetime. The king summoned the court astrologers to predict the boy's future. Seven agreed that he would become either a universal monarch, Chakravartin, or a Buddha, one astrologer said that there was no doubt, the child would become a Buddha. His mother died seven days after his birth, and so he was reared by his mother's sister, Mahaprajapati. As a young child, the prince was once left unattended during a festival. Later in the day, he was discovered seated in meditation under a tree, whose shadow had remained motionless throughout the day to protect him from the sun. The prince enjoyed an opulent life, his father shielded him from exposure to the ills of the world, including old age, sickness, and death, and provided him with palaces for summer, winter, and the rainy season, as well as all manner of enjoyments, including in some accounts 40,000 female attendants. At age 16, he married the beautiful Princess Yashavra. When the prince was 29, however, his life underwent a profound change. He asked to be taken on a ride through the city in his chariot. The king gave his permission but first had all the sick and old people removed from the route. One old man escaped notice. Not knowing what stood before him, the prince was told that this was an old man. He was informed, also, that this was not the only old man in the world, everyone, the prince, his father, his wife, and his kinsmen, would all one day grow old. The first trip was followed by three more excursions, beyond the palace walls. On these trips he saw first a sick person, then a corpse being carried to the cremation ground, and finally a mendicant seated in meditation beneath a tree. Having been exposed to the various ills of human life, and the existence of those who seek a state beyond them, the father offered his son anything if he would stay. The prince asked that his father ensure that he would never die, become ill, grow old, or lose his fortune. His father replied that he could not. The prince retired to his chambers, where he was entertained by beautiful women. Unmoved by the women, the prince resolved to go forth that night in search of a state beyond birth and death. When he had been informed seven days earlier that his wife had given birth to a son, he said, a fetter has arisen. The child was named Rahula, meaning fetter. Before the prince left the palace, he went into his wife's chamber to look upon his sleeping wife and infant son. In another version of the story, Rahula had not yet been born on the night of the departure from the palace. Instead, the prince's final act was to conceive his son, whose gestation period extended over the six years of his father's search for enlightenment. According to these sources, Rahula was born on the night that his father achieved Buddhahood. The prince left Kapilavastu and the royal life behind and entered the forest, where he cut off his hair and exchanged his royal robes for the simple dress of a hunter. From that point on he ate whatever was placed in his begging bowl. Early in his wanderings, he encountered Bimbisara, the king of Magadha and eventual patron of the Buddha, who, upon learning that the ascetic was a prince, asked him to share his kingdom. The prince declined but agreed to return when he had achieved enlightenment. 
Over the next six years, the prince studied meditation and learned to achieve deep states of blissful concentration. But he quickly matched the attainments of his teachers and concluded that despite their achievements, they would be reborn after their death. He next joined a group of five ascetics who had devoted themselves to the practice of extreme forms of self-mortification. The prince also became adept at their practices, eventually reducing his daily meal to one p. Buddhist art often represents him seated in the meditative posture in an emaciated form, with sunken eyes and protruding ribs. He concluded that mortification of the flesh is not the path to liberation from suffering and rebirth and accepted a dish of rice and cream from a young woman. The Enlightenment His companions remained convinced of the efficacy of asceticism and abandoned the prince. Now without companions or a teacher, the prince vowed that he would sit under a tree and not rise until he had found the state beyond birth and death. On the full moon of May, six years after he had left his palace, he meditated until dawn. Mara, the god of desire, who knew that the prince was seeking to put an end to desire and thereby free himself from Mara's control, attacked him with wind, rain, rocks, weapons, hot coals, burning ashes to a shower of blossoms. Mara then sent his three beautiful daughters, lust, thirst, and discontent, to tempt the prince, but he remained impassive. In desperation, Mara challenged the prince's right to occupy the spot of earth upon which he sat, claiming that it belonged to him instead. Then, in a scene that would become the most famous depiction of the Buddha in Asian art, the prince, seated in the meditative posture, stretched out his right hand and touched the earth. By touching the earth, he was asking the goddess of the earth to confirm that a great gift that he had made as Prince Besantara in his previous life had earned him the right to sit beneath the tree. She assented with a tremor, and Mara departed. The prince sat in meditation through the night. During the first watch of the night, he had a vision of all of his past lives, recollecting his place of birth, name, caste, and even the food he had eaten. During the second watch of the night, he saw how beings rise and fall through the